I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Vietnam. The curse of my generation, the boomers. Vietnam. But it is not an American story. It is a story about the Vietnamese themselves and their ordeal facing up to empires, predatory aggressors from Europe. Eventually, America will inherit. However, before America, we all know that Vietnam was part of the French colonial empire. A new book, a sweeping tale filled with ironies that only history can present. You can't make this stuff up. Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam. Frederick Longueval is the author. Frederick has compiled from the French database and the American database an interleaving of the ironies that both empires endure but don't know about each other. What holds them together is a young man probably from the, nor the north central highlands of Vietnam. We know him as Ho Chi Minh. He had a different name when he went to Versailles, the Versailles Treaties of 1919, and sought an audience with the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. Frederick, a very good evening to you. Congratulations for your achievement. Ho Chi Minh, he had a different name. What did he want from Wilson? Why was he seeking an audience with an American president? Well, Nguyen I Quoc was his name at the time. And by the way, thank you for having me on. It's ter tremendous to be here. So Nguyen I Quoc uh, was a, Viet a young Vietnamese nationalist. He had grown up uh, learning about the French colonial overlord, had been trained mostly by his father. From an early age, he dedicated himself to winning uh, liberation for his country and began in 1911. Uh, he left the country, basically hounded by the French, left, spent some time in the United States, in Britain, and then, of course, in France, and came to believe that Woodrow, Wils Woodrow Wilson would be his ally in his quest. He read the 14 points. He read what Wilson had to say about national self-determination, about ending the colonial world as, as, we, as we knew it. Um, and he believed, hey, if I can get an audience with Wilson and maybe with other allied leaders, I can present my case and they'll, they'll help me out. He even rented a, a, rented a top coat for the occasion, if you can imagine, and tried, uh, and tried to get an audience. And, of course, uh, he failed. He failed. However, the French secret police, the Sûreté des Amis Bureau at the time, <laughs> took note of him. They oh, tracked yeah. him. They knew his apartment. They watched him very carefully because even then, 1919, the <laughs> French believed the Vietnamese are not trustworthy. They're sneaky. They're maintaining their empire by stealth. Scene, 25 years later. It's now 1944. We're in Tehran, Persia. And this is one of the great conferences of the allies of the Second War. President is Stalin. President is Churchill. And representing the United States, FDR. There's no Frenchman at the table to my reading here, no, Frederick. That's right. And yet a discussion about uh, whether France is going to regain, after the Second War is successful, regain its French colonial empire. What is Mr. Uh, the, the President of the United States, FDR, what is his opinion? Well, he, he's a very interesting uh, part of this story because I firmly believe that Roosevelt, down to his, to his bones, believed that colonialism uh, was uh, responsible for much that had gone wrong in the world, that it helped create the Second World War. He was determined, I think, to, to try to, to eradicate the colonial system. And he had a particular aversion to Charles de Gaulle, which I develop in the book, um, an almost bizarre uh, I think, dislike of de Gaulle and a low opinion of France in general. And he believed, I think, even at Tehran, even in 1944, that France should not be allowed to reclaim Indochina. The Japanese had, had swooped in after the fall of France to the Germans. The Japanese had swooped in and basically taken control. Now de Gaulle and the French wanted to come back. Uh, and I think FDR believed that they should not be allowed to do so. But what happened in 44? is that I think his, his determination began to, to, to slacken, in part because of his own failing health, in part because of Churchill's insistence that you needed a strong France in Europe. You also needed to have a, a French colonial empire from Churchill's perspective so that the British empire could be maintained. Um, 
And so FDR was, in a way, uh, I think you could say stymied. He was not prepared to put up, I think it's fair to say, much of a fight. But I believe that right to his, to his death in April of 45, FDR was opposed to a French return. And I speculate, as one can do, that had FDR survived, it's not fanciful to believe that he would have worked, uh, tried to prevent a French return, and thereby could have changed the course of history. The ironies heap up, and I correct myself. Tehran was the end of 43, but they're talking about the events of 1944 because that yes, was the return correct. to Europe by the United States, the second front. Stalin very much wanted that. And, Frederick, you make the point that Stalin didn't give a fig about Indochina. He cared to limit France's recovery because he yeah. wanted them to be a minor player in the future. Yeah, and, and of course, he didn't give a fig about Indochina then. He also didn't give a fig about Indochina later. I, I think it's fair to say that it was always a backwater for him. It was not something he cared about. His successors, notably Khrushchev, did not attach that much importance to Indochina either, and, and hence the irony of the United States would make the argument, both in supporting the French and then after the French, that you needed to stand firm in, 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 in Vietnam, in Indochina, in order to, to, to combat Soviet expansionism, when in fact Stalin himself uh, was focused solely on, on, on his immediate envir environs and on, on Europe, um, and really didn't care much about uh, about uh, Indochina. Frederick's book is a marvel of French personalities, French ambitions. We're focusing on the American because, naturally speaking, I live with the burden of this war. And what I've learned from Frederick's book is that everything I've assumed about American understanding of Vietnam when we got into it was wrong because the Americans had access to information Frederick has compiled. And if they didn't know it, they should have in order to make the decisions after 1946. Let's just mention 45 momentarily. As late as October of 1945, Ho Chi Minh is writing beseeching letters to the American president. This time it's Harry Truman, uh, FDR's successor after the, the Roosevelt's death. What does he want from Harry Truman? Well, he continues to believe, and one could say that he was beginning to be naive by this point, but he still believed what he had believed for literally decades, namely that the United States will ultimately be my ally in my quest for independence. The United States was founded, after all, in an anti-colonial reaction. Uh, the United States espouses this rhetoric. The Atlantic Charter talked about freedom for all peoples. So he still believed, Ho did, in the fall of 1945, and indeed into 46 and 47 to some degree, but certainly in 45 when he wrote those letters, that he could get the Americans to help. We should bear in mind that by this point, um, the United States is the predominant world power. Ho understands this. I think everybody understands this. And in particular in the Pacific and in the Far East, as we call it, the United States stood supreme. So he hoped... Uh, and on some level believed that he could have the Americans with him. And, of course, the letters were not answered. And he wrote more letters, and they, too, were not answered. France returns. It takes control of Vietnam. And now the, the resistance in the Viet Minh. When we come back, the massacre that begins this bloody story in Hanoi in 1946. I'm John Batchelor with Frederick Logeval, and his book is Embers of War. The Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. The author, Frederick Logeval, is here. Her, his book, Embers of War, tells the massively long and extremely dense story of Vietnam's quest for liberation, for freedom, for independence. Ho Chi Minh is this character who folds together the first part of this story. His death in the 1970s ends it as it turns into a victory for the Vietnamese and the exit of the Americans. Right now, it is 1946. And a man has taken charge of Vietnam for the French, the Viceroy. He's called the Bloody Monk. Who is he, Frederick? Well, his name is Darjean Lu, 
uh, and he is uh, formerly an aristocratic uh, naval officer who had joined with uh, de Gaulle's cause uh, early in World War II, um, and he escaped uh, from German captivity, joined with de Gaulle in London, and then became um, high commissioner. Uh, under de Gaulle in those critical early months, as you rightly point out, after the war, when uh, the French are determined to reclaim Indochina you know, under French control. And what's critical about Darjeanle is that I think he's given a great deal of leeway. He's able to make decisions, sometimes without the knowledge of Paris officials, uh, sometimes with their uh, tacit approval. Uh, once, uh, on, on a few occasions, he even makes uh, decisions on the ground in Indochina that really go against what officials in the metropole are saying. But he's a he's a very important part of this story and has a great deal to do with uh, with the outbreak of war in '46. The '46 war, whether it dates from the fighting in Cochin China, that's the southern part of Vietnam in '45, or from the massacre, and I like massacres to start. Uh, revolutions in 1946. Yeah. This is December of 46, and it's an ambush. It's cooked up by the French Expeditionary for Corps, and they mean to murder as many of the Viet Minh as they can capture. In fact, they try to capture the whole government at once. They do, uh, and it's a dramatic story how Ho and his principal lieutenants uh, are able to get out of Hanoi, and they then form what will be, a, 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 I guess you could say, a series of shifting headquarters in the jungle, uh, in Tonkin, which is the northern part of Vietnam, and that's where most of the fighting is going to be during this war. Um, uh, but at several points in the story, the French come very close to capturing the, the leadership, and there's another, there's another what if. Suppose they had been able to do so, but they, but they don't. They don't, and now we move because there are an enormous number of events here, and we just have the mountaintops to touch. 1948-49, the revolution in China, watching all of this and the fall of China becomes critical to Ho, though I learn again and again from your book, Frederick, that the Chinese and the Vietnamese do not like each other. Still, when Mao wins, that means that Ho gets a huge boost, and France has a new a a adversary. Oh, it's there, it's an it's a critical part of the story. When when Mao Mao's communist forces in 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 China win full control. In fact, even before they win full control of China, when they control some of those provinces in the southern part of China, um, it has major implications for the war. And the French understand this. The French are not stupid. Uh, and other analysts see that once you control the mountain passes. Um, into China and, and uh, aid and advisors can begin to flow across that frontier, it is, it's really bad news for the French. Now, of course, the French at about the same time, early 1950 we're talking now, when uh, a major uh, patron of their own, they get the Americans to come in to a much greater degree. And so what happens here is that the Cold War, as I put it in the book, the Cold War now comes to Indochina in a, in a full-fledged way, and both the Chinese are important and increasingly so also the Americans. Right. They all tell themselves stories that somehow Moscow and Beijing can work together only in Hanoi, only with yes. Ho. It's a fairy tale, but it suits the purposes of different political ambitions. That's right. A detail yes, here exactly. about the French. What is the bow die solution? Well, the, the French... Um, uh, understand that they need to have a non-communist alternative, if you will, to Ho Chi Minh. They need to have some way to rally both Vietnamese, the Vietnamese people, uh, around some kind of uh, figure other than Ho. They also need to do this in order to win support from the Americans. The Americans still preach an anti-colonial message. The Americans believe themselves to be anti-colonialists. Uh, into anti-colonialists. They don't want to support what they see as a French colonial war. And so from a French perspective, it's, it's imperative that they find um, somebody. And they select the former emperor, Bao Zai, uh, who is uh, an intelligent man, in many respects a, a quite shrewd man, but, um, but not a strong leader, uh, and also somebody who is so ambivalent about working with the French.
that he can't quite bring himself to really uh, work hard for this. Um, but it's a solution that does have the, the uh, achievement, that, that does succeed in, in satisfying the Americans, that you now have in place uh, a non-communist alternative that the West can work with. The story, then, is that Ho is now a communist. That's the claim, even though there's plenty yeah. of evidence that he's a nationalist looking for a sponsor. That's why the letters to Truman, that's mm -hmm. why the letters before the, the beseeching uh, mm -hmm. to Mr. Wilson in 1919. However, set piece, uh, the curtain comes up and we have Ho on a train, not just to China, but all the way to Moscow. And yeah. Ho and Mao and Stalin all in the Moscow winter of 1950 in that yeah. cold, staying in dachas. Now, what yeah. is Ho's ambition, and what does Stalin make of this? Well, Ho, Ho now, uh, and it's, it's quite ironic that he uh, has gone here from working so hard to get American support um, to realizing that he's not going to have the Americans that in fact the Americans are more and more now on the side of the French, are starting to, to, to foot the, the, the bill for the French war, and are helping the French in all kinds of ways. Uh, Ho now is determined to get um, his uh, communist allies to support him. And uh, so he goes on this remarkable trip, as you say, to, to try to, to uh, woo both Mao and Stalin, uh, Stalin is, to say the least, skeptical, uh, both of Mao and of Ho. He thinks that Ho is far too independent-minded, suspects him of being really a nationalist uh, and, and um, not much more. Oh, you Orientals have rich imagination, <laughs> Stalin <laughs> to Ho. Quote. That's a whopper of a quote, Frederick. Oh, it's true. It's true. But he does, he does in the end, um, choose to, to give recognition to, to Ho's government. He, in, in, in effect, instructs uh, Mao to, to take the lead in supporting uh, the Viet Minh. Um, and so in that respect, Ma, uh, Ho can return to Tonkin. He can return to Vietnam satisfied that he has achieved uh, a principal objective. But he realizes on that train back to Vietnam that this comes at a price, that his maneuverability, his freedom of, freedom of action has been constrained because he now has these powerful patrons. Uh, who are going to be certainly helping to make decisions of, of a very important nature. Within months of the, the embassy to Moscow, of course, the sneak attack in Korea launching China and its North Korean ally and their Russian allies into a war with the United Nations, chiefly with the United States. So all of a sudden, the narrative that the communists are going to take over uh, these, uh, Asia, the domino theory, gets credibility in Washington. Next, we'll turn again to the Americans because there's an important personality here, Dean Acheson, Secretary of State, in his opinion of Indochina, of Vietnam, of Ho. The book is Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam. Frederick Glogoval is the author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. The scenes in Frederick Logoval's novel are huge. Novel. It reads like a novel, but it's a history. They're huge scenes. It's as if these personalities are obeying, uh, being cast by Hollywood movie makers to wander in and give enormous speeches. We now have what appears to be a minor player given all these mountaintops. His name is Acheson. Dean Acheson is a man chosen by Harry Truman, I think, because he looks more like a British diplomat than the foreign secretary ever could look. He out Neville Chamberlain's Chamberlain. And Acheson is a natural anti-communist. And despite all the evidence that Ho Chi Minh is not a communist, he's a nationalist, Acheson makes him into or wants him to be. Frederick, why does this suit the Truman administration to treat Vietnam as a communist pawn? Well, I think I think it it um, it suits them both 
for reasons having to do with uh, an emerging uh, ch uh, Chinese threat in Asia, or, a, or at least a perception of a Chinese threat. Uh, and it also suits them in terms of their um, ambitions and their geopolitical needs in Europe where the French are very clever, I think, throughout this period in suggesting to American officials, look, we need to have your backing in Indochina, and we need to have your, you know, your full, full support uh, in Indochina in order that we can then do what we need to do here for you. And you make the case, and I, I asked the author carefully, you make the case that this was cunning on the French part, that mm -hmm. their lobbying Washington was part of their war plan. Is that accurate? Oh, I think it is. And I think this is where the French materials, archival materials and, uh, and, and other literature, uh, other sources, uh, where I think it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And some of the scholarship that has been published on this period in just the last few years, I think also demonstrates that this was in fact cunning, that the French understood that this kind of a message, putting it in rather simplistic black and white terms, and talking about, uh, even, even if they weren't using the phrase domino theory, at least were making domino theory arguments, would appeal, uh, um, would appeal to the Americans. I think the French themselves didn't really care very much whether Ho Chi Minh was a communist. But they knew that in the American uh, mindset, it mattered enormously, and so that's what they played up. Bernard Fall, a young man, enters the drama. He's born 1926, a Jew born in Vienna. He serves honorably during the Second War, is an investigator at the Nuremberg War Tribunal, becomes a Fulbright scholar to Syracuse University in fall of 1952, and then arrives in Vietnam. How yeah. is it that Bernard Falk got into Vietnam and became such an expert? Well, he, he was, he was uh, taking a summer course in Washington, uh, and um, an instructor in that summer course uh, said to him, you know, you ought to study Indochina. You speak French, uh, you served, uh, you have French military experience, Indochina is very important. There's a big war going on there. Nobody's really looked at this. You ought to do this. Uh, and that's how it started. And then in 1953, he went to Vietnam for the first time to do research on his Ph.D. dissertation at Syracuse. Um, and I have a, a little section in the book that, that looks at what he finds. And what's fascinating, fascinating about this is it's precisely as the Korean War is drawing to a close. And the French officers that he meets in Vietnam say to him, look, we can't win this thing. And moreover, it's not important that we try to win this thing in terms of Western security. And why is it that you Americans, or why is it that the Americans are allowed to negotiate a peace in Korea with communists? And yet they're saying to us that we can't negotiate with Koreans here. Um, and he also sees other evidence, Fall does, when he's there, of a kind of um, declining French will, if you will, and he sees he sees problems in the French war effort that I think he then begins to write about, uh, and he becomes uh, one of America's certainly foremost, because by now he is going to be a transplanted American, even though he's French. He lives in the United States and will live in the United States. Uh, one of the foremost authorities on the on the on the war. Enter the new administration. Dwight David Eisenhower elected the famous general, the c conqueror of Europe. He now, uh, using the hidden hand, uses uh, surrogates to speak about Vietnam. But all the major players appear in Frederick's book, including Goldwater, who is not supportive of colonial repression, and Kennedy, Jock Fitzgerald Kennedy, the, the just elected senator, who mm. believes that France is failing. Uh, to provide genuine independence. There was always a paradox with the French message. They were going to give Vietnam independence, but at the same, same time, keep it part of our colony. But the important yep. voice here is Eisenhower, because, Frederick, I read Ike very carefully here, and he's clear that he comes down on the idea that we've got to fight with the French, even though he's suspicious of the French. Yeah, yeah no, I think it is. I think that my book revises what has become a, a, a conventional view uh, which is that Eisenhower is always opposed to intervening on the side of the French, uh, that he sets up the debate in such a way that there is no way the United States will intervene militarily. I argue in the book that the evidence shows that, on the contrary, under the right conditions, 
uh, Dwight Eisenhower was very pre- prepared to go in to try to bail out the French at the time of the Dien Bien Phu crisis. He whips that, up. Um, he whips up the 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 fever. He uses the Democrats. He uses Mike Mansfield to support all of this. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I think that uh, that Eisenhower is uh, to use the later uh, vernacular. He's a hawk, which is not to say that he's eager to go in in 1954. And I think Eisenhower, in fact, understood more than most as a former, as a military man, that, there, that this was going to be a very, very difficult uh, struggle. But he also believed, as you said earlier, in the importance of this and in trying to do what was possible to keep Indochina from falling into, into communism. Because they'd accused Truman of losing China, and he didn't want to be accused of losing Vietnam, even though it wasn't his to lose. Richard Nixon in Vietnam... Uh, Frederick, you cannot make this stuff up. October 31st, 1953, he arrives in Saigon. Saigon. They give him a huge dinner at the Majestic Hotel. He goes on to meet the Emperor Bao Dai, and then he travels all the way. to. He goes to Laos to meet with the prince, and then he goes to Hanoi, and they have another big dinner. And what is his message to the French? Oh, his message to the French could not be more clear. It is, you must stand firm. This is a war that you have to win. You have to win it with our support. This is absolutely crucial to Western security and to French uh, prestige. I mean, he presses all the buttons, uh, and he insists to them that the Americans will be there for them. And in fact, uh, he has, um, if, from his perspective, a, a, a positive effect in that, in fact, uh, a good number of French officers come away feeling emboldened, thinking, you know, the Americans are with us. They're probably with us with troops and certainly air power, if need be. And in, in a funny way, he, he accomplishes what he needs to do on that mission. But it's a very unvarnished, straightforward message to the French to hang in there. Graham Greene's novel, The Ugly American, it's uh, derived... Quiet, quiet American. Uh, the Quiet American. Yeah. The, it's derived from Lansdale, or something like Lansdale, who's an American agent who works in Vietnam at this same period. Uh, Graham Greene, however, had a very clear eye that the Americans were not working for the good of the people. And did the American uh, irony at the time permit that? I know they denounced it at the government level, but did people agree with it? For example, Life magazine was also very suspicious whether joining forces with the French would relieve the corruption or whether it would make it worse or not. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I think that... Um below the the top levels and the middle levels, that is to say people not in government, I think were uh, prepared to see what Graham Greene was suggesting, not only in the novel, which which wouldn't come out until 55, but which is said in, in 51, 52, um, but also in terms of the, the articles that he wrote at the time. It sh- we should note that Greene himself was ambivalent in the sense that he was sympathetic, I think, to French culture, even French imperialism. He got on well with the colonial officials when he was in Saigon, but more and more he came to see that they faced a ferocious, dedicated, and very skillful foe in the Viet Minh, uh, and he thought that the West was ultimately destined to be defeated no matter what they threw into the fight. And you have a quote from Richard Nixon uh, in a private audience when he returned, who seems to, he suggests in the quote, he's aware of the limits of even French uh, American power in Vietnam. Yeah, no, he does. And I think this is one of the, this is one of the things that I find so interesting and, and, and it's, it's ultimately demoralizing when you look at the whole period that we're considering, is the degree to which throughout, really, starting certainly with FDR, but moving forward. At, at regular intervals, American officials, including even people like Nick, Richard Nixon, um, had a very realistic sense of what they faced and of the obstacles. Um, and yet, at each point when they reach that fork in the road, they choose to go in the, in the direction of greater U.S. involvement. And I think it has something you alluded to a while ago that I want to just underscore when you mentioned uh, Truman losing, uh, so, so-called losing China to the, uh, to the communists, I think that domestic political imperatives are really important. They're important for the French in terms of their decision to stay in as long as they did, and I think they're very important in understanding why it is that administration after administration in the United States stays in.
Dian Bian Fu, that is the battle set piece defeat. And when we come back, what it means to France, what it means to the United States, and how it connects to the United States, the Eisenhower administration, embrace, embracing a new leader in Vietnam, Cochin China, DM, in 1957. I'm John Batchelor. The book is Embers of War. Frederick Logeval is the author. This is the story of France and Vietnam, but it's really the story of the 20th century tragedy that defined American defeat, the first ever American defeat at war, Vietnam. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. This conversation with the author and with all the authors are available on iTunes. Just go to iTunes and subscribe. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam. Frederick Logeval is the author. Frederick, Dien Bien Phu, your dramatic portrayal of it with maps. I understand the decisions that the French made that Zap, the, Amer- the uh, Vietnamese commander, made. They fight it out in a, a post many miles from resupply. It ha- can only be resupplied by air. You say that Zap originally meant to attack in January. He held off till March, and that made it successful. His opponent is Navarre and Coney, the uh, bo- the commander and the on-the-scene commander of Dien Bien Phu. The French, did they mean to, to defeat the Viet Minh, or were they looking to negotiate after that battle? Were they looking to wipe them out or to come to like they did in 1945, the, t- uh, the talking table? Well, I think by the time that uh, Diem Bien Phu is, is occupied by the French in late 53, Paris officials, and even, even I think the senior civilians on the ground in Indochina, are really set, trying to set this up for negotiations. Uh, so in that respect, they're no longer trying to win an outright military victory, but they believe that they need to have military success in advance of, the, of those negotiations, which, by the way, Zap believes as well. I think he, too, understands that there are negotiations coming, and the key will be to win a very decisive military victory somewhere uh, in, before that happens. And the French do him a favor, ultimately, because they choose this valley in the remote part of Tonkin, just near the border of Laos. I had a chance to visit uh, a few years ago, and it was astonishing to fly in uh, and land on the Strip and to imagine and to, 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 to see what the French in that, on that valley floor faced back in 53 and 54. They thought they could, uh, in effect, goad the Viet Minh into battle um, and then pound them to bits with their superior artillery. Uh, and, of course, as we know, it didn't happen because of, of uh, astonishing feats by the Viet Minh in getting supplies to the hills overlooking the valley, uh, cutting the airstrip, um, and um, ultimately winning what turned out to be a very important victory, obviously, for the Viet Minh. Right. The Viet Minh win the logistics war, and that wins yes. Dien Bien Phu. There's a scene in Paris when the announcement comes. This is in uh, the spring of 54, when they learn that Dien Bien Phu has surrendered. Uh, you know. The prime minister delivers to the assembly, I believe. And what is the French reaction? Who's the prime minister? What does he say? And what is their reaction? Well, Laniel speaks uh, to to the assembly, and it's a very emotional moment. Uh, and, you know, in those days, news didn't travel as quickly as it does now. So the word has filtered in that the, that the garrison has fallen. But he says that one of the strong points, which is Isabel, and it's in the southern part of the valley, Isabel, he says, is still holding, and it's a very dramatic moment. Uh, and there are, you know, there are people who are in tears in the assembly. Everybody understands that this is um, this is a, a, an absolutely monumental turning point, and the war, which in many respects hasn't been front and center in French public opinion, except for certain periods, now is on everybody's mind. Um, and it becomes uh, a kind of national obsession in the in the days thereafter, as people realize that these gallant fighters, as they were called, who fought so hard at Dien Bien Phu, have gone down. 
to defeat. And, and symbolically, at least, I think it marks the end of the French, the French Empire in Indochina. Uh, and even though they're going to fight another war in Algeria, one could say that it's, it's in, in a certain way, uh, the end of the French Empire uh, writ large. May 1957, very hot and steamy in Washington. The president of the United States in an open car goes to greet a man in a uh, a, uh, double-breasted suit, shark-skin leader of Vietnam. His name is Diem. He's a Roman Catholic, and he arrives to the applause of the American people. He's feted in Washington all the significant players. It's like a Hollywood cast call. For Diem, who is he and what does he represent to the Eisenhower administration in 1957? Well, he represents to them uh, the, the savior. He is going to be the man who is going to keep South Vietnam non-communist. What happened as the French were defeated was that at the Geneva Conference of 1954, which really began just as Diem Bien Phu was falling, was that the great powers decided to divide Vietnam supposedly temporarily, um, at the 17th parallel. And a government, a non-communist government that would be led by Diem, took control in the South. And Ho Chi Minh had control in the North. And so he now comes to Washington, as you say, in 1957. There is great faith, um, or at least a great hope, that he is succeeding in this mission in turning South Vietnam into a a non-communist bastion that will be the, the, the kind of showcase for the West. People are talking about a ZM miracle. Even people like John F. Kennedy, who, who has been and will be skeptical, he is swept up in this. And many others believe that ZM um, is going to do this. And what's happening at the same time, as I show in the book, is that a new insurgency is in fact uh, starting up in South Vietnam that ultimately will engulf South Vietnam, will engulf ZM himself, and deep in U.S. involvement. January 1958, uh, the American Friends of Vietnam, AFV, sponsored the world premiere in Washington at the Playhouse Theater, a screening of The Quiet American. My, Joseph Mankovich is mangling of uh, the Graham Greene novel in which the Americans are presented as good guys and the communists are bad guys. Right then, when Hollywood weighs in, uh, at this point, Frederick, if I had arrived from Mars, I know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. The oh, yeah. question that the propaganda had to get to this level, did this influence everybody? Were, were people laughing in the theater or did they buy this? Uh, you, know, I, you know, I wish I could have been in, at the theater. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't born yet for another few years, but it would be really interesting to know uh, what the reaction was. What I can say on the basis of my research uh, is that the the movie was well received, uh, and in fact, I've seen the film a couple of times, and it's actually quite well directed, uh, and and um, in many respects, is an impressive uh, piece of work. But as you say, Green's novel has been altered in very important respects, um, and it's a message. You know, it's transparent what what the screenwriters want to do. Um, and I think it's a message that sells, even though as the movie is screening, people who know Vietnam and know what's going on are aware that there is this new insurgency that is underway, that the film depicts uh, something that is not actually happening, um, that is contrary to what was actually going on, both under the French and then more recently. Um, and in that respect, Graham Greene, who was outraged by the film and by the, by the alteration uh, for the screenplay, Greene, I guess one could say, has the last laugh. Yes. Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire, and the Making of America's Vietnam. Frederick Logaval is the author. It is a magnificent achievement of documents all weaved together from the French and the American. And finally, Ho, in 1946, Warning. If the tagger ever stands still, the elephant will crush him with his mighty tusk. But the tagger does not stand still. He lurks in the jungle. He will leap upon the back of an elephant and tear...